this morning, I wasn't here for the very morning, but I, I heard that, that there was some discussion about that, that phrase that I just loathe, which is breaking in. I just hate that <laughs> phrase. I think it should be outlawed, because actually, uh, it's not my experience that you break in, and I will just give a speech since someone put a microphone in my hand. Um, <laughs> it's my experience that you start your career where you are, like wherever you are, your career has started, it has started, um, just notice that. And that you start your career and you start to do whatever you can do where you are, and that things end up happening because you've taken some some steps, some thank you, some positive action. So, so I, in other words, if you're not working, that you have a career. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. I do think it's really important to think in certain terms, actually, rather than like how can I break in, which implies that there's an adversarial situation. It implies all kinds of things that actually I think are counterproductive. Um, but we will talk about, I think, two main things. I think we're going to talk about how you do end up you know, having someone pay you to write in TV. And also what the people who hire, because we have people in both worlds um, and who've been in both worlds, you know, how the people who hire, what, they, what they're looking for in a new writer. Um, does that sound good? And then, and then the stuff that we don't cover, you're definitely going to ask me about, ask, ask them about. Um, so basically, I would like, I was sort of starting, um, with you, Aiden, because I was I was curious because you said you got a job right after college, right? You got a job in TV right after college. So I'm just going to target you and ask, how did you, what 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 happened? What transpired? Uh, well, I guess my, my very very first job after college, I was terrified because um, the job market back then I thought was bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> that was the golden era. Um, so a friend of mine had graduated before me and uh, actually got a job in New York on a, on a TV show. And he said, I think I can get you a job here as long as you move here. And I was, I, again, I was, I was so terrified. I was like, fine, I'll do it, you know, whatever. So I moved to New York for a PA job. Um, and, uh, and that show lasted in the blink of an eye. It was gone. But it was a John Wells Productions show. So I came back to L.A. And from there, you know, John Wells was starting two pilots, um, Third Watch and West Wing. And I, uh, I, using those connections, I was able to get a job as a, a PA on, uh, on both of the pilots, actually, because, you know, the, they're produced in L.A., um, even though Third Watch was shot in New York. And, um, uh, you know, they both went to series, and uh, they were looking to staff up the shows, and, you know, I was, I was there, luckily. And all the producers, I, uh, this is what I was told how I got the job, all the producers um, had hired comely lasses to be their assistants, <laughs> and so I think they felt they needed a token guy around the office <laughs> to lift, like, jugs of water and stuff. <laughs> so I became, I, I, they sort of said, how, okay, how, you know, now you can be our writer's assistant. And I said, okay, sounds good. And um, just the fact that you use the words "comely lasses," uh, I think says so much about you. And, um, no, I mean oh that's it, no. It's a, there, there's definitely there a writer. Are things you can say. <laughs> no, that, that's that's definitely a writer. I mean, come on. And um, that would have been dear to you, to me right away, actually. I mean, there's there's just something about someone's vocabulary and having it be a little bit colorful and eccentric. Um, okay, so. So basically what we're learning from that is, or what I'm getting from that is, it sounds crazy, quote unquote, moving to New York City just for a PA job, but you had an instinct that you needed to get that job. Pretty much, yeah. Um, I, you know, I do have family back east. I'm actually from back east, so it wasn't the craziest idea in the world. But I had always planned on, you know, on staying in LA um, and working LA, in LA. But I was, you know, I, I, yeah, the job was open in New York, and I was, uh, you know, I was happy to relocate. You know, just, you know, don't, don't. I guess, you know, my feeling was, don't be afraid to, you know, do something kind of bold, and you know, feel free to change up your plan as you go along. It. Uh, what I got out of it was the power of terror. <laughs> Is that too? Seriously. <laughs> well, expound on that. Well, I mean, I started writing partly because I was terrified and desperate, and I really thought I couldn't work in the straight world, and um, and so I just absolutely knew I had to do it and make it work, and um, 
the, he's talking about it, humbling yourself, being willing to <laughs> do something that's not your idea of who you are. But I, you know, I was sort of joking when I, I talked about the power of terror, but it really is, um, can be a great motivator and allow you to feel uh, humble enough to do things that can lead to better things. So yeah. that's kind of what I, I got started because I was a comely lash. <laughs> <laughs> and you still are. You still are. Um, <laughs> well, I can't let that go by. What? Um, no, how did you get started? And, and also, I know the answer to that, but um, you know, do you think anybody else would like to guess? Or? I think people. I'm interested to hear your story because I, I it's hear Andrew. okay. Let's hear Andrews. Oh, okay. Um, I uh, I think how how I got my, how I got the job that I have now is kind of illustrative of a couple of kind of in, useful lessons about getting started. Um, my first job after I came out here for grad school is where I first figured out I wanted to be a sitcom writer. And my first job was uh, as an assistant in the comedy department at 20th Century Fox. And I think that, that, you know, networking and meeting people is great, but I think there's no substitute for the relationships you build when you're actually working with somebody. Um, and especially in a lot of entry level jobs in this industry, so much of it is just about effort and attitude. And I worked there very hard for two years, and at some point, you know, they started asking me, what do you want to do? Do you want to get promoted here? And I, I said, no, I want, I want to be a writer. And they then introduced me. But when the next staffing season came up, they introduced me to a whole bunch of executive producers to, for writer assistant jobs or assistant jobs on a show. And one of the people they introduced me to was Seth MacFarlane, who created Family Guy. And this was right at the time that Family Guy was coming back and American Dad was starting. And a job working as his assistant opened up. Um, and then... Now, had you been writing, had you been writing all that time? Yeah. The I whole mean, time it was, you were... You know, working you know, on a very busy desk during the week and then on the weekends working on my material, my specs. Um, while, while I was still at Fox, I got my first agent, which I thought was like, oh, great, I have an agent, I'm going to get a job, but that's not how it works often. No, as we all yeah. know, agents don't get you work. No. Um, we learned that the hard way. Yeah. Um, and then while I was an assistant at Family Guy, um, I, you know, again, based on the relationships I made when I was working at 20th Century Fox, I sold uh, two pilots to my old bosses, two pitches, which I wrote while I was an assistant at Family Guy. And then the other kind of, I think, useful lesson was, especially when you're starting out, but I'm finding, and maybe particularly for comedy, part of a career as a working TV writer is doing stuff for free and doing people favors. Um, well, what stuff? Give us more yeah. details. Uh, well, on, when I what favors? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, when, when I when I was kind of starting at Family Guy, it was right when the show was coming back on the air, so there was a lot of demand from like magazines and newspapers to interview Stewie Griffin and Brian Griffin and Peter Griffin, the, the characters on the show, and one of the writers was doing it, and it was just free work, and he was doing it to be helpful, but. You know, it was free work, and he'd rather not do it. He'd rather spend time with his family. So I offered to help out, and I started, like, I would write half, and he would write half. And then after doing that a few times, he was like, you know, you can just do it, and I'll, you know, I'll read it over. And then it, it would go to the executive producers to just approve it before it went to the magazines and stuff. So that gave me the opportunity to be read by my bosses. And through that, I got uh, two freelance scripts, and I got to write a book for Family Guy and Harper Collins, and eventually got promoted. But it was largely because, one, I took the initiative, and two, I was willing to just do whatever I could to get my material read, you know, whether it was paid or not. Yeah, that's. I think that's a great. I mean, the attitude you're describing is, you know, it's interesting because this is the thing. Um, my, you know, Robin and I and Jan and I and my friends and I talk about a lot, I think, is is that, you know, you have, you're a writer, so you, there's a part of you that's kind of antisocial or at least shy or potentially um, almost like a, you know, like a, a non-social being. I mean, writers tend to be outsiders. They tend to be people who like to be left alone with their thoughts or their fantasies. You know, we live 
we live in a in an industry that's very um, interpersonal, where it's all a, 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 a literally a family of people get together and make something together, and it's this two parts of your personality that get brought into to that 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 have to kind of grow somehow. It has to be that part of you that's willing to be alone. And do you want to speak to that, Carter? Or well, I was just going to say, you know, I I came to writing what I considered to be very late, uh, right around, I wrote my first script when I was 30. Um, oh. uh, That's crazy. Nice. Um, and I, I had a whole different career path and I grew up with very traditional parents who said get a very stable career and, um, and, and so listen, it was hard for me to- To those parents, that's- Yeah, and now they're very, they're very happy that I ignored their advice. Um, <laughs> but it, What I, was your career? Uh, I spent my 20s as an ad executive um, <laughs> in New York managing the Michelin Tire account, <laughs> which uh, was soul sucking. <laughs> and, um, and then I moved out here to go to business school at UCLA. And I got my MBA. And I, I, I'm sorry, I'm totally, I'm skipping over you. I'm going <laughs> no, first. No, no, you <laughs> didn't. It was Winnie. Who Believe but, me, we'll get to Jay. <laughs> but I, I, um, I got out in 2001. And uh, September 11th, I think, affected a lot of people. And for me, it was, I, just got an $80,000 graduate degree and I don't want any of the jobs it's prepared me for mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do with my life. Ah! And uh, so I, I essentially took a year off and uh, I got a bunch of part-time jobs uh, to pay the bills and I said I'm gonna just find myself and there's a reason why I'm here now. Um, and, and I'd chosen UCLA because I had an entertainment program. I, I've always been a TV junkie, and I was at a dinner party, and I met a guy who was a writer on Smallville, and I, and I was just transfixed. It was the first time I'd ever talked to someone. I kind of didn't even know that this job existed. I mean, I, I was, he was talking about what he did and how you know they work together to crap, break the stories, and then he writes a script and gets to go to set and work with the actors and the director to make sure his vision is on screen. I'm, I'm literally like, no way. <laughs> what? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and then uh, I called him a couple days later, and I said, you know, I I want to do what you do, and, <laughs> and he was very he was very honest. He said, you know, you're not the first person to tell. Me. Um, but to his credit, and this is what I will say to all of you, he did not say that is a stupid idea. Move on. It's too hard. Right. He said, go to UCLA, take a class in extension, see if you have any talent. I'll read your script. Wow. And uh, so I wow. wrote a Sex in the City script that um, spec, uh, and because you know I'm a gay guy, and <laughs> gay guys love Sex in the City. So, um, so I wrote this spec in literally 48 hours. I had so much fun doing it, and I turned it in. Uh, my my teacher at the class was like, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. And I was like, oh, OK, it's pretty good. <laughs> and a friend of mine from business school said, I, 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 I know this guy who works at an agency. I, I love this script, and I'll, I'm going to send it to him. He works at this agency called Jersh. <laughs> and I was like, OK, send it to him. So she sent it to uh, the, her friend who was an accountant at Gersh. And uh, so her friend in her office did to the TV lit department. And I got a phone call saying, liked your script. Do you have anything else? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I have a Will and Grace. <laughs> and I wrote a Will and Grace in like two weeks. And I sent it to them th was saying, thinking, wow, this happened so fast. I'm going to get my agent and my job and my, you know, all these things. And and they were like, that it was really strong. We we let's stay in touch. I'm like, stay in touch? What does that mean? Um, and then uh, literally that same day, a friend of mine from the class said, Are you applying to the Warner Brothers program? So I applied, sent my script into that. I was accepted into the Warner Brothers program, which landed me an agent. Um, I did not staff out of the program, but I, I landed uh, an agent who at Jersh? At UTA. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then they basically, I was convinced, you know, once you get an agent, then, you, you, then you're always worried about keeping your agent. So then I was like, they're going to drop me. I'm not making them any money. And uh, he said, well, you know, kind of as busy work, why don't you write a pilot? So I wrote a pilot um, that uh, just happened to get sold to ABC Family that following year. And uh, so my first time on set was for my own pilot, uh, which was a pretty cool experience. Is this just a phase, Carter? That's just a phase. Just tell them a little bit 
about what that was about because so, that's a good lesson too. I didn't know what to write. Um, I was like, I don't know what to write a pilot about, and it's, and someone gave me great advice, which is write 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 it as a as a showcase of who you are as a person. So I wrote essentially a Wonder Years set in the 80s about a little boy growing up in North Carolina who the audience knows is going to be a big homo when he grows up. <laughs> and, uh, and it was it was the best thing I ever did because it stood out. It was all about me. It got me a ton of meetings. Um, it got bought and it really uh, it spoke to who I, I was as a person, and I think that it's so easy in what we do to be constantly thinking about what do people want to read, what do people want to read, what do people want to read, and not think about, well, what do I want to say? And um, so I feel really lucky that I got that advice at the time that I, I did. And, and one thing I want to say that I think everyone should hear is that my story, I think, is proof that people can break in without any connections, without any all you need is talent and perseverance. And I think it's important, two things, to, to not have a backup plan, because if you have a backup plan, you're going to take the backup plan, because it's really, really hard. And to find people to champion you, because um, you know, I, I think writing is so subjective, and people responding to your work is so subjective that half of this business is finding people who say, you know what, I like you, I like your voice, I want to see you succeed. And that is a, is a huge reason why I was able to now have a TV show in the air, is I, found, is I crafted some relationships with people who genuinely wanted, wanted my voice to be out there and wanted me to succeed. So I think when you find those people that are champions of you, it's a really important relationship to foster. And yeah, that's really well said. I want to welcome Jonathan to our panel. Hey. We still love you even though you're late. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> my, my, I was at Comic-Con and my car got towed from the train station. Oh, you so. were at Comic-Con? Oh, oh my was, gosh. Yeah. Well, yeah, apparently you can only park in certain lots overnight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. What costume did you wear? What? What costume did you wear? I, did, I didn't actually go to the, to the, to the floor. Sorry. So were you at Comic Con because you're apart. into um, writing comic books? Um, or? I'm, I'm actually I'm writing a graphic novel right now, so I had to go and schmooze. Cool. Okay, so. so since we're talking, it says after graduating from Vassar, you began your film career working in publicity. So how in, at Fox Searchlight? So how did you get? How did you get? How did you get <laughs> your first writing job? Um, it was actually, um, I, I moved out here during the strike, um, which was really good timing. <laughs> um, and I just had a, a bunch of months to not do anything. So I wrote, um, I, I, got, I got repped, and I wrote a spec pilot. And You said you got repped? Yeah, I mean, I got repped. How I, did that happen? I, it was actually, it was really, um, everyone was uh, kind of down on meeting with writers when I got here. And I directed a short in film school, and it won the Directors Guild Award. So all of a sudden, people were like, oh, well, we don't want to meet with you as a writer. We'll meet with you as a director. So, um, so I met with all the agencies, and I signed with the one I liked. And um, Jersh? Yeah. We weren't here for that. And... Um, and then I and I wrote a spec pilot while I was waiting for the strike to end, and it just happened that I wrote a noir pilot, and Rob Thomas had just come off Veronica Mars, and he was he loves noir, so he was awesome, and he just decided to take a chance on someone who'd literally done nothing, so it was it was amazing. Well, um, but you hadn't done nothing. You had directed. I directed. Did a you short. write that movie that you directed? I did. Yeah. yeah. So you wrote and directed a movie that won an award. Yeah, which is really really helpful. Yeah, that was <laughs> <laughs> that was a smart move. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's wise to win that award. So that's sort of um, similar to your story, Jan Oxenberg. Yeah, this panel is really great because, you know. I've been on a number of panels, and you hear a lot of the same advice, you know. But what I've heard a lot of people emphasizing here is relationships and knowing, like, for example, I, I want to ask you, not, not while I'm talking, but later. Um, <laughs> you know, you have to know the etiquette. If you're an assistant, what is the etiquette of giving your work to the people you work for? 
it's it really takes a lot of emotional intelligence. You know, you obviously, well, basically, I was wondering if you would like to be my mentor and supporter. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, I mean, obviously, there is something very personal and about emotional intelligence and as a writer who may be shy or have Asperger's or whatever, mm. you know, you almost have to create yourself as a character. I think that's really well put, actually. And I think you need to have some kind of, some kind of um, developed, you need to develop within yourself that way that you relate to others that really works. Yeah. That mm. Now, I was able to transcend my complete lack of emotional intelligence <laughs> by making a movie. I also got started by making a film. Um, I was an independent filmmaker. I um, struggled, you know, I did the whole thing, not which bill should I pay this week in New York, and I made a feature film called Thank You and Good Night. It was at Sundance. It was very well received. It tied for an award. So I didn't like get the award just myself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the, you know, it was. A, so I mean, it sounds like an award. That's half yeah. of an award. That's huge. But I mean, before the screening, before the first screening at Sundance was over, I was approached by a, an agent and a distributor, which sounds like wow, dream come true. You know, it was so easy. And, but the fact is, it took me like 10 years to get that film made. And it was, uh, you know, I, I did transcripts, I cleaned my mother's house to make money. Um, I mean, I did everything that I had to do to get that film made. And, um, and then I had another, I was going to, uh, so my, the way I got started was very idiosyncratic in that I had this film and it did get me a lot of meetings and so on. But the way that I really got started in television, because I hadn't even thought of being in TV, was I was at the Sundance Writers Lab um, with another feature script. I met Jason Kadams and Matt Reeves, and Jason was working for Winnie. And uh, so I moved here, and um, should I tell, can I tell him that story? Because it's really funny. Okay. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> here I was to like totally yeah, broke, really. totally broke, you know, but. But, Not you know, really getting funny. these meetings and stuff, well, I think it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like Jason's that. working on My So-Called Life, and he shows Winnie my film, Thank You and Good Night. I didn't know Winnie at all. So, uh, you know, and then he comes, he says, Winnie loves your film. And I'm like so excited, you know, this TV show. And he said, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. She's so busy. And then he goes back, and then he comes back, and he says, well, Winnie said, that hiring you on a TV show would be like putting a bird in a cage. <laughs> so I'm like, is the rent on the cage paid? You know? <laughs> but anyway. Um, well, you know, now that we've brought it up, um, you know, obviously everybody here, um, not everybody, but I mean, a lot of us here have been in both positions where we're looking, where we used to be, we're looking to get hired, and then, you know, there's, a, there's this change in our lives and we're looking to hire. And one of the reasons I think I said that is because I was obviously, lear uh, not obviously maybe, but I was learning that year, um, wow, it's, it's people find it hard to imitate how my show sounds. Um, and so that's like this whole issue in TV that's kind of hard to, I guess, Maybe maybe we have a crack at discussing it interestingly here because we have a really this is a really good panel for that it's very diverse too, but it's like that thing of, you know that thing in TV which is like how you know you do you do get noticed in TV at any any time there's a good script people people notice so basically it's your writing, but then a lot of times when you're brought into a show it's how well do you write that show, that sound, those people, those characters, how well did you make Sex in the City sound like Samantha and, you know, Carrie? Um, so that's a whole other issue maybe we want to talk about. Well, I think, uh, you know, it's funny to having just gone from someone who was writing scripts to someone who is reading scripts and hiring writers. Um, I found it very eye-opening that there, uh, 
what, and this is my opinion, there are a lot of bad scripts out there that, that, that people who take the time to learn the craft of a script, of a spec especially, and spend the time reading and really absorbing how the, I mean, um, really understanding how these characters' voices sound, uh, and then the people who clearly wrote it in a week. Well, when you say a bad script, let's let's I, let's really talk about like what would that mean yeah. to you? Well, to me, to me, a spec should be the you should finish it, and it should be oh my god, I wish. I, I just watched an episode in my head of the show, and it was one of the best episodes ever. It, it should be that good because um, otherwise, it's just gonna it's just gonna read like all the others. And so you really have to set the bar high in your work and your material. It, you know, I genuinely feel like the people who who take that extra step, who really um, get notes from people that work the script. Work it, work it, work it. Everyone you know, even if it's your mom who doesn't know TV at all, get them to read the script and genuinely hear their criticism and decide yourself whether or not you want to take it. But I, I feel like a lot of people write their script and they're like, I think it's great. And, and, and so much of this business I'm learning more and more is not only the advice it's not only how um, how good of a writer it's are it's how do you incorporate notes how do you how do you find a way to keep your voice alive within the voice of another show and it's really and do, hard to do and doesn't that also come down to what we were trying to talk about before which is like the interpersonal connections I, I Aiden, you is your, your name's Aiden right yes yeah mm -hmm. um, I you never finished like how did you get from writer's assistant to getting the the job um, well, yeah, there, there were a lot of spec scripts involved, um, but... Uh, How many spec scripts? And um, I've had to estimate... I mean, specs for West Wing, or is that what I did were you write, writing? I, specs did, for? I wrote a spec for West Wing, um, to, and and to, you know the idea that you know they would make it, and I sold it, and then the crazy stuff behind the scenes went on, and they ended up not making it. Um, uh, and then they made almost the same exact script after I left, but that was, uh, uh, that, that's another story. That's another panel. <laughs> but but how, uh, <laughs> how many, to answer Robin's question, how many specs do you feel like you may have written um, before you got your a writer's a, a, before you got paid to write? Before I got paid to write, well, like I said, that was the first one. So I was lucky that I got paid for that first one. And right. like I said, like I was thinking, like, all right, one script, one paycheck, it's that easy. And uh, then after that, it was a lot harder, though. There was, um, I probably wrote, so um, uh, not like Carter. Like I, I, I had the one sample and I sent it to agents. And like, great, what else you have? And then. Just like you, I, I wrote a, a, an undeclared script in like a weekend, um, which didn't 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 open too many doors for me since the show got canceled like the next week. But um, so I wrote that. Then I'm God. Uh, I'm just gonna have to estimate here. Uh, probably wrote about seven specs, and then um, and on top of that, maybe three or so pilots. So. And what and what was the? Is there a script that you can look think about that? sort of was a door opening script for you that um, well, the West Wing script helped. It, it sort of like you know told people like you know, well, he's not just you know he's not just the guy that changes the water. He, he, he actually can't write. Yeah, yeah, and so you know I had you know I could actually you know call myself a professional writer. Um, uh, and then after that, I guess um, you know for, for me, I, I don't know if that's the best question for me because I I you know I I, I got I hooked up with a producer. Um, and he, he, you know, he he was sort of like my mentor. And you know, once he got a show on the air, he was, you know, he, he knew I was a good writer, and he was going to give me a job. Right. Um, so it wasn't like you know he didn't read like one spec and like okay this is it you you're, you're all set. It was just you know he's read enough stuff of mine. And he's like okay I know you can write. So you know as soon as I get a show on the air I'm going to give you a break. But to follow um, up on what Jan was alluding to and what Carter was talking about, how did it become okay for you to give this producer your work? Are you talking about John like, Wells? Was it? Yeah, no, no, not it, John Wells. It was, uh, I mean, was it? Was it a guy that was kind of close in age to you? I mean, what? What was the circumstances that? Come on, who is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just curious. Like, how did that come about for you? That it was okay to go, 
I'm the guy who changes the water, but here's my script. And you know, it was it's scary. I was I, I, I actually did want to like comment on that because it it, was, it was, I was terrified to give someone you know above me a script a because you know what if it sucks and b. You know, he's got to read like so many scripts. Like, why is he going to want to read my stupid thing? Um, but I found, you, and you, you can usually tell, like, you know, which which producers and which writers are like kind of receptive to that, and you know, and and, and like kind of like mentoring the younger writers. Um, other ones, you know, you know, they'll shut their door, and you know, they're they're not, they don't send out like you know this, you know, the the you know you know please like you know I I'm curious to read your stuff. <laughs> right. Try to avoid those, but but you know there are people who like you know will read like your script like and you know and, and give you notes and uh, you know it doesn't have to be a home run it could it could just be you know a, a pretty good sample it needs some work and and you know this person will help you polish it and I remember one time specifically I, I, I went to this you know I was I, I, I uh, you know I, I struck up like you know kind of like a friendship with one of the producers on the show and so you know it was kind of natural that I was gonna ask him to, to read my script but then like I know later on um, you know I, I had like another friendship with someone else but I, I, I you know, I, I was like, I don't want to burden, like, I really don't want to burden anyone else with my script. Like, you know, I have the one guy, he's enough. And later on, another um, assistant said, like, you know, Matt was mentioning that, like, you know, he's, he, wondered, he wondered why you haven't, like, given him a script to read or anything. <laughs> and I was like, well, does he want to read something? And, and so the answer is, yeah, for a lot of producers, they, you know, they're curious to read what you have. Like, you know, don't, don't give them every draft of everything, but, but you know, they'll, they'll, they want to read what you have and, and give you notes and, and give you a break if, uh, if they're capable of doing it. Right. I, think I, I also think it's, it's, it's having some sensitivity. I mean, I feel like, you know, if, if you have someone in your world that you want to read uh, your work and you know that their opinion of it could matter and make a difference and be an opportunity, uh, for me, I think um, I respond much better when I have a relationship with that person and then they ask me to read their script versus, hey, will you read my script? You know, it's, it's like the, the person who comes up and just says, hey, will you read my script? You immediately, I, I find now I'm immediately like, oh, God, another one. But someone who's like, I would love to talk to you about the industry, how you got in. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, someone who's willing to say, I, you know, I, I respect where you are. Um, you know, this is who I am. It, it just, it, it helps to uh, grease the wheels in, in a sense that then when I read that script, I know a little bit about this person. I know who they are and what they want to say. You know, I, I would caution against, you know, sort of just giving your script to people as uh, on first sight. I mean, really think about, okay, is this someone I can craft a relationship with? You know, is this someone that I can Or have build? I crafted a relationship? Or have I yet, yeah. yeah. And Carter, I think you're gonna have 150 people wanting to talk to you about the industry, and um, uh, there's a couple different- wait, wait, um, oh, I'm sorry, oh. Andrew Andrew had something, and then, and then we'll oh, go Oh, didn't get to talk yet. That's okay. What? I'm so bored with my story. We're gonna hear from but everyone, but. Um, I think uh, I'm bored when it comes to uh, asking your boss or higher ups on a show you work for to read your material, I think the first step is to work very hard and do your job very well. Because like the PAs on our show, like they do PA stuff, they run scripts, they change the water, but they probably don't realize it, but we in the writer's room totally notice when somebody is working very hard and when somebody has a great attitude and that makes you want to help them. When, when they're doing this job that isn't very glamorous but they're doing it as best they can with a great attitude. I think that's the first step in terms of asking people to read your stuff. Right. Yeah. I think that's what, Robin? Well, I just kind of wanted to chime in uh, on basically what we're talking about from the point of view of the person who people want my help and my attention. And um, I love what you said, Andrew, because the way I look at it is when people come at you, there's a certain energy when they want something from you. And, you, and I just shut down. I just like, how can I get away from this person? Uh, I, uh, they want something from me. Whereas if you approach someone and you want to serve and you want to help me, what it does is it softens me up 
to want to help you. And that may take a long time, as you were just hearing from, from Andrew and Aiden. Um, I can think of two different examples of people, one from the show that Carter and I are working on, and another one that now I want to do anything I can to, to help them. But in the case of Stephanie, um, she was our writer's assistant on 10 Things I Hate About You. She started writing older. I don't think she wants anyone to know how old she is, but she really started, she had a whole other life, a whole other career. Then she decided she wanted to write. So she's sitting in the room, a highly intelligent person, literally typing, taking notes. First thing I notice is her notes are unbelievably intelligent because you're in there and people are just spitballing and you look at the notes. She doesn't miss anything. It's organized really well. So you start going, okay, my back is covered by this woman. Then eventually we start asking her opinion because she's kind of intelligent. So we go, Stephanie, what do you think of this? And it's a very intimate situation. We have a small staff. So there she is sitting there day after day. And then eventually uh, she asked Carter to read a Actually, I asked her. Oh, you asked her. So now we're really seeing like, you know, in, in a room you start noticing somebody can be at a higher level a writer and all I know is I don't care what they think. I don't want to hear them. I've now shut them out because I don't respect their opinion. More and more we're like, what's Stephanie think? What's Stephanie mm -hmm. think? So Carter asked to read a, an old Christine that she'd written and he really liked it. And we we kind of ran out of writers. We need someone. We needed an outside writer. So at the same time, we sort of got this Literally idea. The next day, we decided the next day, let's give her a script. Because there she had been sitting in the room. She knew every. She'd heard every single conversation we had. She knew the ins and outs. She knew the characters. She knew she the knew characters. The the, so we give her this thing, and I've. Like, we would talk about something. She must have stayed up all night. The next day, she would come in with, like, notes and notes and notes. It was a story we had so much trouble. So we must we have done eight different times. versions of this. She was insanely resilient. She would come back and do this whole other version. She'd put her own thought into it. If the show comes back, she's going to have a staff writer job. Oh. Um, and I, she's just fantastic. But she really had this way of letting us kind of discover who she was, making herself indispensable, showing, trusting that we were going to see how sm smart she was. But at the same time, she had that spec script. Now, early on, she'd written some novel or something that was won some contest and when I heard that I was just like yeah, we both how can I get sure. out of this you know I don't want to look at it, it. <laughs> neither one of us read it I don't want to look at it she didn't she didn't offer she didn't say oh please would she you read she talked about it in that sort of leaving it hanging oh way God, this, that this has happened yeah that we could have picked up on it but anyway that's the story of Stephanie the other person I was in New York working on a pilot I needed an assistant I hired her fantastic assistant like everything that had to be taken care of was taken care of also I don't live in New York so I'm stranded in New York so I'm spending all my free time with this girl and <laughs> she is so much fun to be with she's smart I get to know her then uh, she was still my assistant I wrote a couple pilots and she very kind of respectfully pitched a couple lines in the pilot. I love her lines. And now she wrote and um, produced this short film that I thought was terrific. I'm helping her get an agent. Um, I'm hoping that, again, if the show comes back, that she's going to be a staff writer on the show. Now I'm so invested in her, plus I respect her, and she didn't invade my space or my goodwill. So you'll find somebody that's just going to bend over backwards for you and make it, I'm making it my project to, to get Nikki launched. I feel she deserves it. And Stephanie, we love her. I mean, she's useful beyond what her title is going to be. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, you're, you're hearing the same thing from both sides. I do, th and I think that, that a career in television writing, which I do think is very different than a career in feature writing, is 
50% your work and your talent, and 50% your personality and your ability to work well with others, and to adapt and be resilient and be able to, and be humble, but also be persistent. I mean, there's, there's um, I think it's a different animal, because feature writers can literally write a feature script. I mean, they still need the relationships with film execs and, and things, but the, the collaborative nature of TV really means that your personality and your interpersonal skills are, are really important. I, I think a t TV career is half a great job and half therapy every day. No, it's true. It's, it Jonathan, shines a you big laughed light that. on, on well, how you deal with the world. Well, well, I just, the story of how you got started, you that story you told me about yes. Richard, do you want to tell them that? Because that was so moving. Well, um, I could tell my story, but also, did you want to say something to that, Jonathan? No, I just, I, I agree. It's, I was just talking about a, a writer you know. Um, and we were talking about how the room is like, it's, it is, it's group therapy. It's amazing. And, and um, especially on Cupid, where we were dealing with love stories all the time, it's like, they know so much personal stuff about me. <laughs> where, like, and I would be watching episodes and I'd be like, oh my God, that... This is embarrassing. <laughs> if anybody knew that was actually something that happened to me, um, and it just becomes if you have if you have a good personality, it'll take you so far. I I mean, but you know, I don't think it it has to be not to interrupt, but yeah. I th I think I don't think it has to be only one kind of personality. No, no. Um, you know, I think it has to do with what we're all the things we're really talking about is is. Be, being of help when you can be, reaching out, um, knowing when to, when not to um, upset someone or or be overly um, needy towards yeah. someone. Um, that was the best skill I learned as an assistant was when to shut up. <laughs> it's, wow. It's become the most important skill I know wow. in a room because there are times when people get into something and you just sit back and let it play out and right. then go right. back and, and not insert yourself yeah um I, yeah yeah I, I agree i i've made a mistake which i'll share with you guys to hopefully you you can avoid making it when i was a uh, first assistant at family guy i would fill in sometimes in some of the gag rooms typing and uh, when I first did it, I pitched too much, and that was off-putting to the writers because they were there and it was their job, and I was supposed to be typing, and that set me back a little. Obviously, I, I recovered from it, but it was, you know, looking back, I, you know, I wish I had known the etiquette a little better, and I'd been actually a little less aggressive. I mean, that's. I think we that's also had that that situation, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I can't stress enough what great advice that is to listen. <laughs> I mean, I really, you know, it'll it'll gain you some confidence, but it'll also, uh, you know, you'll you'll learn. You'll maybe hear we'll hear other people pitching what you thought of, so you go, okay, good, I'm on the right track. You'll get a feel for people, and sometimes it can really be overwhelming. And it's an it's an organism. It's everybody interacts in a certain way. You know, you may not piss off the showrunner, but you may piss off the person they like the best, and then that person's complaining about you, and, or, you know what I mean? There's, it's a dynamic. And, yeah. um, and I, I just think, uh, I've had to work so hard just in all areas of my life on listening more. I think that's something we all work on. I mean, I, I, I mean I'll just speak for myself. Um, well, now I should listen to the audience. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Let's let's take questions. Oh, okay. Well, I'll I'll tell my story. Um, but you know, I I have I have in the past. Robin knows this. I have in the past prefaced my story by saying, you know, getting getting your first job is and 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 telling the story of it is like, you know, when people say, "How did you get started?" To me, it always has reminded me of saying, "Like, how did you lose your virginity?" Because then I'll go off and try to lose my virginity that way. <laughs> and it's like it's these these are so, you know our stories are so individual. Well, They're tell so that story. How yeah. <laughs> really? Actually, my writer story is so much yeah, better, <laughs> and it really felt better too. <laughs> Uh, it's much more, much more exciting. Um, but there's a quality in your story yeah, that very yeah, much speaks to you. You're right. Work. Well, my story is, um, and, it, and, it's, and, it, and you'll see, you'll see th uh, elements of it uh, in, in, in different people's stories that we, you've heard. But my story is that um, I was, I was writing in New York. I was, I was. Um, 
you know, in a, in a, in a grad, well, I, I was in a comedy group. I was writing and performing comedy with my friends. We, we really um, did that for years. We, I probably was in that comedy group for five years. It, we, I don't think we made, we never made our rent that way. We all had other jobs, but it was, it was this thing we were doing. And you know, you could look at that as like, oh, that poor thing. She's like slugging away at this comedy group and she doesn't make a living and you know, how pathetic. Well, that comedy group you know, is just very instrumental in my story. Because my story is that years later, I'm in my 30s, um, I'm married to an actor, we have a daughter, and we decide to move to LA for his career. And my career is just, just nowhere. Um, I don't have a career at this point. And I, I do have a daughter, so I'm busy being a mom. And my brother is, off, is a cinematographer, and he gets offered a job at a, a show called 30 Something that was at the time like a pretty cool show, a very cool show. And it was my favorite show. And he said to me, I think I'm going to turn down this job because I don't want to write, I don't want to shoot TV. I, I want to save myself to try to get a feature job. And I said, um, you've got to take this job. I said, it's like the best show, and it's my favorite show. And you, he hadn't even watched it. So he watched it. He took the job. So a few weeks later, I'm newly in LA. Like I said, I'm, my, my daughter's two or three. My brother's shooting this show. And he says, come on to the set and just hang out and watch me shoot. So I do this. I'm a little scared to do it because three of the stars of the show I knew in acting school when I was young, they're on 30-something, and I have nothing. So I'm a little embarrassed to go, but it's my brother, and I want to see him shoot. And anyway, that's not, even then I'm knowing, like, that's not a good reason not to go. So I go to the set, and this guy whose episode it is, who's producing the episode, he wrote it, he's one of the main writers of the show, his name is Richard Kramer, he says to me when he meets me, oh, my brother told me about you. He said you were a really good writer. Turns out his brother had been one of the guys who was instrumental in giving our comedy group its, one of its first productions. Again, this is his brother. You know, I have no idea that that's going to happen. Um, then, uh, then comes the crucial moment in the story that I have looked back to millions of times, which is that I go home, my friend from college happens to be sleeping on my couch, and I tell her this story, and she says, oh, this is so cool, what are you, when are you gonna see him again? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, he gave me a compliment, um, that was really nice. I, I couldn't believe anybody knew that, you know, I even wrote anything, no less complimented me on it, but I, I was clueless. She said, no, you have to write him a letter and you have to say you need advice about your career. And I said, what career? <laughs> and she said, no, you have to ask him for advice. So I wrote him a letter. He said, I'd love to give you advice, but I'm in the middle of a season and you know, keep calling me because when the season's over, I'll come in and I'll give you advice. And this was so unlike me, and I think doing things that are unlike you are a very good idea. Um, it was very unlike me like to think, oh, you know, my, my usual thought would be, well, he just said that to be polite. I can't really keep calling him. He's a very busy guy, and I'm me. Um, but what I did is I kept calling him because I just started to do, th I was doing things that weren't like me, if you see what I mean. So after about three months, I go in to meet with him, I ask him advice. I'm just like, I throw myself at his mercy. I'm like, here I am. I don't really know what I'm doing. He goes, well, if you, wrote, if you wrote a spec script, I would read it, which I was so new then. I didn't even know what a gift that was. But I did write a spec script. He did read it. They did buy it. And that began my career in television. So I think, the, for me, there's a lot of morals of the story. But to me, a big element of that story has to do with my little comedy group, which was everything. It was the thing that was right in front of me that I could do. It was just me and my three friends who were funny and we all wrote comedy together and performed it. It didn't cost money to do it. And we just made a show that way and we didn't even know, like throwing something into the ocean, you know, like throwing a, bo a message in a bottle, we didn't even know where it was gonna wash up to shore. But for me, that, that was a life-changing, you know, thing. So that's my little story. It's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> and my
<laughs> what? Uh, yeah, it's the story. It's the story of the brothers. Exactly. It's very karmic brother story. So someone just shot their hand up. Okay. There's a microphone. Hi. This question is directed to Robin and Carter um, about the Stephanie story. So, what happens when Stephanie uh, moves up? If Ten Things I Hate About You comes back, and that creates an open position, where do you go to fill? that open position kind of in the vein of how you staff your writers and your writer's assistants? Well, generally, we would probably hire from within. Okay. We would probably hire a PA. We lost our assistant and we hired a PA. So again, you kind of get to know people and like happened with these guys, you know, they're, they're in, they have the shittiest job, but they're in position. There's some people that you're receptive to and other people you aren't. So we would often do it that way if we if we were for some reason unable to hire Nikki as a staff writer I would want to hire her because I know we would get a really cheap basically cheap another writer and someone who would really contribute well, it, it's it, it's interesting because you know when I started um, I just got my MBA and I was like I'm not going to be a PA you know <laughs> like I really had this sort of chip on my shoulder about it um, and and it worked out for me in that I was still able to succeed but now that I'm running a show and I see the importance of familiarity and the risk involved with hiring someone new versus taking the the bird in the hand the person that you know is great and dependable and 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 I think god I wish I wish someone had told me that I mean it, it worked out well for me but I do now in hindsight feel like um, there's something very valuable about those jobs as horrible as it can be to be making copies or to be you know getting someone's lunch order um, it is it's a really wonderful way to to find these champions but also and to people that and to learn the business it, I was gonna say it's not horrible I mean let's put it let's be honest I mean it's a great way to understand how a TV show is put together. Yeah. I mean, you've got a bird's eye view of it, and you're really seeing all the all the elements of it um, come together. And a TV show is a huge enterprise. Huge. I mean, even a little one like yours is a huge enterprise with a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, m more questions. Um, I just wondered about that let's keep in touch line because just as someone who's had people read the first script and then ask for the second script and then heard let's keep in touch or even let's have lunch sometime, I'm just wondering, or, am I ever going to have lunch with these people or should I really keep in touch with them? Like should I really be actually keeping in touch? <laughs> well I kept in touch um, and I think that I was really having that thought balloon as Robin would say of gee I guess I guess he said that but that's going to be kind of humiliating for me to just keep staying in touch. But when you think about it, why? I mean, in, unless you're doing it in an, in an, I think it's really important. We, we're really talking about style. A lot of this is talking about your personal style. And if you can keep in touch in a way that doesn't um, annoy a person, that isn't like a gnat flying around their head, um, that is a way that really is thoughtful about what it would feel like to be them. Um, I think you do keep in touch because how can it harm you if you can keep in touch in a way that's stylistically chilled out so that it's not overwhelming to the person? Well, I, I also want to say, you know, when you, if somebody gives you encouragement, you don't want, you want to find, you want to give them no reason to say no. So if they say, I'll see your next thing, you sit down and you write your next thing. Uh, you, re you rewrite it. You get it in better shape than the other one because you're not going to have a lot of shots with this person. Unless the person really sees promise, they're going to glaze over. And if, if you're not hearing anything back from the person, no, you should not stay in touch. If the, even if the assistant is calling back saying, so sorry in production, can't call you back, that to me is still an opening. Keep writing, writing, and writing. Oh, this was Richard's assistant, by the way. Richard never spoke to me until we were in the meeting. I mean, again, he his assistant would sometimes say to me, well, he's busy, but he says stay in touch. Do you want to? Oh, no, I was just going to say that, um, and you never know who will help you later on, because when I was, when I was 18, I was an intern um, on the ice storm, and I met James Seamus, and 
Aww. he was like, he was like, you're great. If you ever need help with something, give me a call. It's James James. What am I gonna do? Um, so, but then you know, years and years and years later, I he teaches at Columbia Film School, and I wanted to go there, so I literally gave him a call, and he was, and he said, send me your spec, and I'll read it. And I never heard anything from him. And then six months later, I got into Columbia, and he saw me in the hallway and said, I'm really glad I could help you out. And it was just, uh, I was like, I didn't even know you did. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, people are, if they, if, they, if they think you're nice and they think you're hardworking and they think you're talented, they will go out of their way. And I've, I've had so many times in my career where people have you know, gone so far out of their way. I mean, my, Rob Thomas literally picked up the phone and called a half dozen showrunners to find me another job when Cupid got canceled because I worked my ass off on that show and and it just people are people are a lot nicer than than you think they are. Well, the other thing too is make friends with who you can talk to. If the person has an assistant, do you have anything in common with the assistant? Connect with the gatekeepers. Um, you know, there's then at least you can get information. Uh, you know, the per then that person will help get their boss's attention to get your next script. Keep writing and writing and writing and writing. Get better and better and better. Don't stop writing. Um, I just, before I forget, too, uh, I was in the Groundlings comedy group, which I thought at the time was a big waste of time. <laughs> and, uh, and literally I kept thinking, oh my God, I'm wasting so much time when I should be working on my career. And um, <laughs> but genuinely, it was I, at the time I didn't even know I was a comedy writer. It took me a while to figure that one out. Um, but that again late, led to there's a lot of people who have hired each other. You meet actors. You end up working with actors. That's where I met Lisa Kudrow um, and a bunch of other people. But you learn how to write. You know, everybody here is just saying like, do what you need to do. And for me, the most fun advice to get is what if you find something fun or you're passionate about something, follow that. Don't dismiss that impulse. Carter's Big Break was writing about something that seems so personal, specific. Do people really care about a kid who's going to be, you know, a big queen when he's later, who's from <laughs> North Carolina? North Carolina? Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, or be in a comedy group or whatever it is, wherever your passion leads you, uh, it, it, you know, this is one of my favorite stories. Barry Camp, who created Coach and Newhart, um, was living in Tucson and he was an insurance salesman. And he loved TV. He was married, he had a small kid. So he writes a spec script and he literally would look at the credits at the end of the TV shows he liked and just like, figure out what the address was and send them off. He wrote 18 <laughs> spec scripts, 18, sends them off, nothing. Then um, Jerry Van Dyke was performing at like some Holiday Inn in Tucson. <laughs> Barry Kemp goes to see him, sees him, goes home and writes 100 jokes overnight, gets him to Jerry Van Dyke. And Jerry Van Dyke, knew Jim Brooks, because I guess he'd done My Mother the Car, or some <laughs> horrible show that Jim Brooks had done, sends Barry's spec script to Jim Brooks, who was just starting Taxi. Wow. Hi, they hire Barry, they hadn't even met him, he moves here to do Taxi, and the rest is history. So to me, that, that just goes to show you, in a weird way, it doesn't really kind of matter where you are. And Yeah, it doesn't. When he, you know, it's Everybody knows, it's no secret right now, the economy sucks, the business sucks, everything sucks, right? But somebody's got to work, right? Somebody's getting these jobs. So if you can go at it from a place of being positive and just um, resilient, I can't say um, humility and humble enough. I just can't say those words enough. It's really, really hard. You view yourself in a certain way, but you just, you know, and even Winnie, you know, it's, Winnie and I have had talks, it's so hard for her with the, with the accomplishments she has and the stature to put yourself out. And that's, that's what she was saying to you, too, is you just don't want to call somebody when they've ignored you or whatever. And 
you just have to be willing to have your feelings hurt. Yeah, well, it's ri it's risk. Well, it's you know, what, one thing I was going to say is, Jonathan, you were talking about create making a film. And when I made my film, there wasn't the internet, you know, the cheap production. I mean, it wasn't 50 years ago, but, you know, it was... But now, it is so much more accessible for you to, you know, go to the groundlings or find some people to shoot it, to act in it. You know, you don't have to wait all your life for someone to put your thing on the screen. You can do it. You know, make it five minutes. Anything that'll capture someone's attention. Well, that's why I said in the beginning that thing about how I hate that term breaking in. Because I feel like it's not about breaking in, it's about doing something now that's interesting to you, that's really interesting to you, that could in potentially interest others because it's so interesting to you. Right, like I had to, I had to spend 10 years with, with my independent feature. I mean, I went to film school, so that gave me a context in which to make some short films. And, um, and coincidentally, my, my first short film that ended up getting shown in festivals around the world was, was being a girl from Long Island who grows up to be a big homo. But, um, <laughs> oh. so you know, that, so that might that be film. a really winning formula for yeah. you guys. Uh, um, e even if you're straight, I short. think, uh, I no. think we... Dion, tell, he, he well, missed that. I said my first film in film school was about being a girl from Long Island who grows up to be a big homo. <laughs> so we have a theme. Oh. So but that on could the, be on a the, formula. On the flip a, side, my, my short film, when I pitched it to the Columbia faculty for my thesis film, is about a Hispanic girl who's worried about getting her period. <laughs> and they were like, why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> was she a uh, wise Latina woman? What? Was, she, was she a wise Latina woman? No, she woman, was a 12-year-old girl. And <laughs> she, and they said, this is, this this is the worst idea you could ever do. <laughs> they said, what do you know about being a woman? What do you know? Like they uh, all, and then I had, on top of that, I was like, and I'm really, I'm gonna shoot with a 12 year old girl and I'm gonna shoot it in two days, 16, mm -hmm. and they were like, they're like, this is gonna fail, but Godspeed. Um, <laughs> and I just did it because I thought it would, and it, and it was a comedy. But wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Finish that sentence, you just did it because. Because it was, it was exactly what I wanted to do. It was, it, and, and it, <laughs> they hated it. They 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 saw the rushes and they were like, "This is this. I don't get your tone. I don't. It's right. it's satire. And, and it's not what you're doing." And then um and then it won a bunch of awards and they um and they were like, "We loved it the whole time." But <laughs> 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 well, my feature film that I was telling you sort of got my career going was about my grandmother dying of cancer. And it starred. It's very, very funny. And it starred um, real people in my family. It was document, half documentary, half scripted. It had every buzzword that would make somebody want to hate it. But my, okay, so grandma dies of cancer, and it had real people, actors, and cardboard cutout characters, and uh, who, were, who were literally made of cardboard. I mean, it was just the kind of thing you would do if you were really trying to get a career in Hollywood, you know. <laughs> um, and I thank God every day that I did it because, you know, in a way, it's kind of been all downhill since then. Because you know, my TV career is kind of like putting a bird in a cage. I oh, think. shush! <laughs> She has, she has done, you have written so much great TV. No, um, it's true. I, I, add, I stand add, on that. Um. No, I think I might add that, um, just because I know you, that I think you've written, you've put yourself into the, into the formulaic TV shows that you have in fact, um, not all of them formulaic, but some of them have been quite formulaic that you've written, that you've been on staff with, and you've put yourself into those scripts. I think that's probably true of every one of us on the panel that, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for people, but I'm betting, I'm betting that, that within the sort of intense formula of a television show, one one of the things that you do, I think, that can set you apart, that does have to set you, that, that you do have to do, is pour yourself into that formula and make it be about what you find interesting. Don't, well, Absolutely. I know you agree yeah. with me. Are you trying to have, to have a career, to be a TV writer or a success or whatever, or are you trying to be 
an artist and a creative person and express certain things that you need to do. Because if it's the second, then there are so many mediums that you can do that in, whether it's a comedy group that doesn't earn any money or something on the internet or, you know, and, and that's, that's what will get you to be the success. Your next step. You're not, you want to get to your next step. Um. Well, and that's interesting. I, I, I just like to say something since I see a lot of faces out there that uh, um, don't look like you just graduated college. And I know a lot of people worry about, um, you know, am I too old to pursue this? Am I, uh, has my opportunity gone by? And I genuinely feel that, um, you know, it's not about, for me, it's not about age, it's about what does this person have to say? And I think the more you've lived, the more experiences you've had, you're so much of a more interesting person to have, uh, you're a deeper pool as a showrunner to, to, to get ideas from and to get inspiration from, you know. So I just really think that it is. Um, if you can open your mind to that. If In other you can words, open your mind to I that. think a lot of people struggle with, with the, it's just what you were saying before, Robin, which I loved, which is like, you know, somebody's going to get these jobs. It's like somebody wrote to me recently, a girl that I knew when I was, um, you know, growing up in on Long Island, and she, she and I sort of still know each other, and she has a son, and she was saying, could you give us advice? It was that it was that email you don't really want to get. It was like he's interested in theater and how do you start and how do you get an agent and why is the sky blue and <laughs> you know those kind of questions. And um, I found I had to answer her because I really am fond of this woman. And so I wrote back, you know, there are no answers to those questions and yet and it's seemingly impossible. And yet every year people get agents and every year they get but they to use the phrase I hate, break into this business. Mm -hmm. They just do it every year. So, you know, somehow in their minds, there isn't an option that they can't do it. Yeah. They're, they're, well, you know. it's, it's, I agree with you, breaking in is the worst term for uh. it because you're constantly waiting for them. I'm still waiting to be like, I broke in because <laughs> as a writer, you're constantly, f even once you're successful, now I'm terrified my show's going to get canceled. I would tell Robin the other day, I was like, I just don't want to have to look for another job right now. <laughs> like, it's hard and it's emotionally draining. It's like my old career uh, in advertising was like the most boring straight road you could ever and I saw exactly where it was going. Now I'm on this roller coaster and some days it's like woohoo and some days literally I'm just like I just want off. I just want off this <laughs> roller coaster. I want to get back to the, but you can't let yourself get off if if you're <laughs> if you're meant to be <laughs> meant to be on that roller coaster. I, I, I don't know what you yeah. meant. I, yeah. you know, it's 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 an emotional um, I mean I I, I just would say to all of you, like, if, if it's stressing you out right now to be in the position of, like, is this going to happen, it, it, it doesn't get easier. So you have to find a way to... I think that's see. a good thing to say. It, 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 it's a high it's level wonderful, of... It's wonderful, but it, it doesn't right, get do, easier. Would you guys you know, agree? Well, uh, I, wait, yeah. I just want the, the, the two younger ones to... Well, I <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. The two younger uh, ones? <laughs> what are you counting out of that? I'm so curious of these three guys. No, no, no. Jonathan is ageless. After what Carter just said? He's, like, the, he's just definitely said, I feel the like one. No, he is too, absolutely. But I just want... Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh God. What, his whatever. Skin, his skin is gorgeous. <laughs> um, we're, we're all very young. But um, I, ju I just wanted to hear from you two guys. Well, I wanted to agree with two things that Carter said. The first, I, I like the way he described it as it's about taking the next step. It's not breaking in. It's not like you're not in and then all of a sudden you're in. It's just what you're doing now and doing it as well as you can to get to that next step. And then when you have momentum, you know, like John had with his film, taking advantage of that to get to your next step. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to read about is, yeah, even once you, you know, you're somewhere where you thought you're, once you got there, you'd be in, it's still nerve-wracking. Like I've I've written four episodes now for Family Guy, and each time I go off on a script, I find a new reason to be terrified. You know, first it's like I got to write this well so I can write another. Then it's I got to write this well so they'll promote me, and then I got to write this well so that I prove that I belong. And then I've got to write this one well because I did the last one well, and they'll think now I'm complacent because <laughs> I've proven that I belong, and now I don't care anymore. So you always find a reason to be nervous if it's something you really care about.
That's also yeah. spoken like a comedy writer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's so true. I mean, that's just a writer, isn't it? I mean, it's so terrifying. I wanted to ask... John. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, I'm was, sorry. I was going to say, and, and there's always some goal you're going to have in front of you. You're never going to get to a place where like, yep, you know what, everything's set now. I could just put it on autopilot. Like, you know, I was, I was just thinking, I used to think, like, if I just get into film school, everything's just, you know, just, you know, paved with gold from there on out. <laughs> graduate, it's like, okay, well, now i got to get a job. But once I get that, everything's set. And then it's like, okay, I have the job now, but now I need to get a writing staff. But once I'm on there, you know, it's all good. And it's, it's, it's there's always going to be something else you're you're gonna have to like reach up for and, and work you know work your ass off to get so it's it is and 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 Carter uses the exact right word it is a roller coaster it's but it's but you know as opposed to like his former life I I, I wouldn't want a boring life it's it's stable it's got that and sometimes that is attractive but you know uh, you know when it's all said and done I, I want to have some like you know cool stories to tell my grandkids so that's you know that's that's part of the reason why I'm here well I wanted to ask you I mean you get your job on Cupid. Right. Cupid lasts a minute. Half and a minute. Yeah. Half a minute. And <laughs> Rob made all those calls. Are you right. on another show now? Yeah, I am. I'm on um, the new uh, this new CW show called The Beautiful Life. You should cool. go watch it. September 16th. With or without awesome. Misha Barton. <laughs> Misha is in New York right now. She's getting ready to shoot on Monday. It's going to be mm. awesome. So you shoot in New York? We shoot in New York, yeah. So, but, but the writers live here? Yeah. C Cupid and um, Beautiful Life both. Apparently I'm only hired on shows that shoot in New York. <laughs> um, it's actually really helpful because I lived in New York and so they always, nobody else in the room had ever lived in New York so they always turned to me and they're like, where, where would the models live? Right, where so would the models want to go? Where are the... <laughs> <laughs> so, it's I've actually, lived in New York all my life and I don't know the answer to those questions. <laughs> I, I just want to see your, your film about the girl who gets her period. I mean, yeah, that's all can, I care about now. You can watch it. You can all watch it online. Is it on YouTube? It's, on, it's not. It's too long to be on YouTube. Where is it? It's on, if you IMDb the film, um, I, if you win something, apparently IMDb puts your short film up. Oh, so, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, so yay. Yay. <laughs> you know, when if you I IMDb me or the name of the film, it pops up in that little box at the top. What's the name of the film again? It's called First Period. <laughs> 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 Catchy. There's a. <laughs> Just so endeared yourself to me, I can't even tell you. <laughs> okay, we should take more questions. Wait, wait, but Just, yeah, but Jen had one thing. I had a very practical thought when you were talking about getting the email from your friend that you kind of dreaded. You know, I feel really guilty because a number of people have contacted me, and you know, more than I wish. You know, I haven't read it or whatever, but I was just thinking that. Of the things that I read, the one thing that really helps me is if the person is completely, like, okay with it taking as long as it takes. You know, I mean, even if, if someone were to say to me, you know, just if you would just put this on a shelf in your office and if you ever get around to it, or that, I think, would free me to yeah. feel okay about it. It absolutely. We'll take more questions. Yes. <laughs> Out of curiosity, when you sold Just a Phase, what was your position title that you were given? Um, that's a good question. I think on the uh, on the pilot, I think I was. I think I was an execu executive producer. Well, so. Wasn't it Big Homo? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was Chief Homo. Um, but it is, it is, it's, it's, it is a, um, you know, it is a whole thing about earned credits. You know, I sold it. I was an executive producer on my own pilot, which didn't go. And then I still started as a staff writer on my first wow. series. So, and what year was that? Know, that was, that I got a staff job? Or no, the, you sold Just a Phase? I sold Just a Phase in 2003. Um, no, I'm sorry, 2004. We sh shot it in 2004, and then... And how many episodes were you allowed to write since this was your first? Well, it, it never went to series. Oh, it didn't go to series. Yeah. Okay. So it, it, it just, okay. yeah. Hmm. Okay. Sad. Thanks. Oh, there's questions here. Oh, right, you're next. So since we are, though, talking about breaking in, because you talk a lot about the relationships, and that's a lot of what I've heard since I've been here is about the relationships, but... I think when before I got here, it was all about the contest, uh, you know, before I actually moved here. And so what do you think about the role of contests? I mean, now I'm here. Yes, I can build those relationships, but, like, do those contests even matter? Well, I think for, for one thing, I, I mean, I'd love to hear what other people on the panel think, but I think anything that gets you writing 
matters. Because let's face it, the bottom line is not relationships the, uh, on some level. The bottom line is your writing, you and your writing. And it's like how you don't, you know, it's this horrible truth, which is that you don't get better at writing without writing a lot. And you, you don't ever have a script that's great unless you're Noel Coward or somebody that you like wrote, you know, one time. Usually you rewrite a script and that's what makes it great. And so like that, if a contest, even if you didn't place or anything, if a contest is getting you writing, then by all means, I think the contest. Well, and I think, uh, you know, I got in the Warner Brothers program, which, which didn't get me staffed, but it, it introduced me not only to a great group of writers that I've kept in touch with, and again, it's all about relationships. Some of them have done really well and have given me notice of opportunities, but they also give you a mentor and things like that. So, so and I know the Disney Fellowship is extremely competitive, but, but a really excellent opportunity to get your foot in the door. Um, you know, we've worked with one this season, and, and it's a fantastic program. Um, I know a lot of those script writing pro contests, though, I mean, I think that some of those are just money makers, you know, for the people that run them. And I think they can be a bit of a trap, especially when you don't win. It, it can be an emotional, like, oh, well, I'm not good enough to win that contest. And, you know, it, it's, it's, you never it know. Doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything about you or your worth or, your, or how good your writing is. I mean, I definitely think you could create a little contest with you and your friends. Like, you know, let's give ourselves three months. We all have to finish a script. You know, we're all going to, like, you know, decide like which is the best script. I mean, like just anything that gets you writing. Um, over here. Oh, cool. Um, earlier, Carter had mentioned uh, you have to set the bar really high for yourself when you're writing your spec and work the script. How do you feel about writing a series, a spec for a show that's brand new, that probably will have some life because it's headed by a star? Um, I think it's a smart. I mean, I think that. You know, uh, this the real thing I would always look at in evaluating what you're going to write is how many of the executives that are going to read it will know the show. Because, you know, if they don't know the show, uh, your spec, no matter how good it is, they're not going to know the characters. They're not going to. They're not going to be able to see its value because they're not going to know the show. So that's why I would caution against specking like our show, <laughs> which has, uh, you know, it's a basic cable show and not that many people watched it. So you know, if you're if you have the feeling like it's the right tone for me, I can knock it out of the park, and the industry will probably be wa reading watching it. If it's done by a superstar, the industry's probably going to be tuning into it. And I think it's a really smart move. What do you guys think about specs versus? original material in terms of what you'd rather read when you're hiring? You know, it's so many people are doing original material right now. Uh, and I, I find it really exciting. You know, you read someone's original material, you really get their their voice. And, and, you know, I think there used to be a whole showrunners didn't like to read original material, but I really think that that's gone by the wayside now. Well, I have, have such a weird career uh, for many reasons, but I've only worked on new shows. So for me, I really don't like to read spec, uh, spec other shows. I really like to see original material because I get a feel for who the person is. Sometimes if I'm on the fence and I'm like, boy, this is a great piece of material, then maybe I'll read a spec. But mostly, I really don't like to read specs. Um, I, they just kind of bore me. Mm -hmm. And um, there's not that many shows I like, um, especially when it comes to comedies. Um, so yeah, I like original material. Honestly, I've been finding that I get more meetings off short stories than I do off anything script-wise. I mean, I got, I, I got the beautiful life off a short story. I mean, it just, it's like it's your unfiltered voice. That's coming fascinating. Out. Yeah. We hired Jason Kadams um, on our show off of a, a short play that he'd written. Um, you know, it just was a great. It was just a great voice. Yeah. They, I've never written a spec, and I. I wouldn't know how to evaluate one, even if I really knew the show well. I mean, you know, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. I mean, I think, I guess there was a convention in the TV industry years ago that you wrote a spec, but to me, that's almost like a hackneyed thing. It is. It's such a antiquated thing, but I think everyone still needs a strong one because there are still agents and, and executives that are is stuck in that, I think, well, what an spec antiquated do you think looking. I should write. <laughs> I don't think I should write anything. Well, you know, I, I think, it, well, it, I, but I think also when you're starting <laughs> off, 
I think it's a good exercise. I yeah. Spe- yeah, I think I would, I, having, having done both, I think if I, there's personally, as, as a young writer starting out, if I had gone out and the first thing I wrote was like a pilot, I would have gotten lost. Yeah. I, I, I think that ha- I think that writing two or three specs before I went out and tried to write my own TV show, at the very least, was good for practice. It was good practice writing. And also, I think that's really helpful because I actually have two specs and two original pilots, and my agent puts them together. To, yeah. For depending on the show in like different combinations, so that it's like my my two specs are comedies, and my two original specs one's a drama and one's a thriller, and she'll you know rejigger like oh you're going out for this show I'll put your this comedy with this thriller, mm-hmm. and it works really well. I mean it's also writing for scripts. But I think what what you said and Winnie said about it doesn't have to be a TV show, you know in other words it doesn't it's not like sure. oh it's an original pilot, mm-hmm. a short story. You know, uh, an or article. It has, I know to, pe- it has to grab your attention and make you want to keep reading. Exactly. No, but what I'm saying is, you know, like pages. Jason <laughs> got the job off of his short play. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be, uh, I know someone who got a job off of a piece of personal journalism. Right. I I mean, I'll, I'm will i just going to throw in a little pet peeve because I haven't said it in a long time, but I, I remember reading specs um, that were meant, that, you know, for our, our own show. And being like infuriated because I just wanted to like like you say, will say like throw it across the room because people were breaking rules or killing off characters or something or having a character move away that I you know what I mean it's like it's like it's it was insensitive to what was working in our show or what we would never do right. you know and that kind of thing just makes you want to th- toss it. You know, it's very annoying. It's like the the, script, the spec opens with so and so moved to Cleveland. So now we have to. I'm like, in what in what universe would I ever do that? You I know, I don't think I've ever been on a show where anyone had read a spec of that show that that captured the voices, at least as the writers themselves know it. It's just not possible. You're not going to be able to get inside their mm-hmm. mind. Um, I remember going to be more critical reading a spec of your own show. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah there's, it, I, I remember there was a West Wing spec where everyone called the president my president instead of Mr. President. And just, it was really basic <laughs> rules like, yeah. They called so. him mine Fuhrer. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. it, that was Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I call our president, though. Um, well, you know, it's almost... Do we have one more? Oh, just one more question. Okay. I was interested in the created by, if you're creating a show and you are not necessarily interested in the traditional showrunner, um, like the day-to-day path. Can you speak to that and, and strategies and that type of thing? Are you talking about you would... I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you're creating the show, you're creating the Bible, you're creating this world, but... Um, it's not necessarily where you, you're going to birth it, but not necessarily be like the... Why? Why would you not be? Where are you going to go? <laughs> you're you're going you're gonna to go to Hawaii at that point? <laughs> well, go and create other things. Why? Um, just a lifestyle choice. Strange. Just strange. <laughs> in, other words, in other words, you've invested in this thing mm-hmm. that you've invested in so much that you've gotten a whole bunch of people excited about, and now they're making it, and you want to go away? Why? Well, to uh, at least if you're talking first about year. like John Wells or someone like that, where he does that, where he like writes the pilot and then he moves on. I mean, he's John Wells. I mean, yeah, you know, it's different. He's not like a normal writer. I mean, that's a well, whole, and, he's an industry. You know, I think also Maybe just... Maybe I'm wrong. Well, that's the question, though, about that It's a good question, path, yeah. and it, it's, it is, you know... I, um, I don't think I understood the question. I okay. think it went over I my think head. I think running, creating a show, it is it is like creating a, a, a living, breathing organism. You 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 cast it, you you pick the crew, you get this great group of writers, and, and it starts to have a life. How are you going to make it be good, ma'am? I mean, what, and, and I'm the, sorry, but how are you going to make it be good if you walk away. How, the whole nature of TV is people tune in every week. They've got, that. let's say you were lucky enough they got excited about your show. They want it to keep being good. Yeah. Actually, they want it to keep getting better. Yeah. It's hard work. You can't just walk away. Well, but maybe you meant in terms of the managerial part of running the show. Yeah. Because it's not even like you have a choice, really. I mean, now, 
if you haven't run a show and you create a show, they're going to put a showrunner with you yeah. who has run a show. Well, maybe that's what you meant. Yeah. Okay, but that person will hopefully... You will be there right. learning phase, through that person. It's not like you go away. You will be there learning how to do what that person does. You'll just be having a learning curve. Now, I was on a show with that situation where there was a very experienced showrunner and like a genius young writer who had created the show. And this showrunner was so great and so secure and such an artist that his commitment was to let the writer sort of, he, he was there to support the writer's vision, you know, not to take it over or anything like that. That's the kind of showrunner you want to work with if you create a show. You know, that's the ideal. And that's what I have in Robin, I have to yeah. say. Yeah. You know. yeah. I've, yeah, I've, yeah, I've had me. that. Um, I, I wanted to say something because I, I'm not sure if I did, because you said lifestyle. And I guess, m taking what everybody said here, if you're somebody who wants to create something and your urge is then to create something different, don't work in TV. Because you also use the term giving birth, and it would be like saying, I'm going to have a baby in order to immediately give it away. <laughs> and like, however you want to raise my baby, that's okay. But I still have to see it walking down the street, that baby <laughs> that you're wrecking. Yeah. You know, it, and, and, I and a show, yeah. to me, a show doesn't get created in the pilot. If you're lucky enough, mm -hmm. and I'll turn the compliment <laughs> back to Carter, that you're looking at a pilot that's really well executed and well cast and really well thought through, you're still discovering what the show is. It's not like this thing, it's like all done with that. You're at least for the first year, you're still figuring out what the show is, what the tone is, what what kind of stories you want to tell. It's it's not something to be looked at carelessly. And you you know, my guess is if you were ever fortunate enough to be in the position, they'd have to pull you away from it with a crowbar. <laughs> but if you don't feel like it's something, you know, write movies, write books. Find some other outlet for your creativity because this ain't it. And and, and I you. do you think you did it perfectly. Yeah, right. that's I, what that's what I meant. But I was just being obnoxious. And I think it is it is <laughs> lifestyle wise though. That's a different another difference between TV and film, is that TV is a grind, and you're really making sacrifices to do it. I, we have several writers who have small children. It's difficult, you know, and, and it is a tough, tough work environment. You know, you'll work intensely and then you'll have a hiatus for a couple months where you have don't work at write. all, but you have to write and you have to find the next job. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It's really, really hard and I think people sometimes don't expect it to be as, gr as big of a grind as it is. Make sure that you have to do it. You have to do it. It is not a job, it is a calling. Winnie and I teach a class which we're teaching our fourth year of it in the spring and I hope you guys come. Oh no, but, in the fall. In the fall, excuse me. But everybody there, it's almost like a drug. We're obsessed with writing. We get Academy Award winning writers in our class and we're still talking about it and how do you do it and what's the process and how does it be good and how do you get out of bed in the morning and how do you deal with the rejection it's this is a life not a lifestyle and not a job so I guess if you take one thing from me that's it do I have to do this do I have to am I obsessed with it am I tortured by it and do I love it do I love Where it? Where do you teach your classes? <laughs> it's here. Right here, and we're going to have it this fall It's again. called Anatomy of a Script. It well, will be probably be Tuesdays Tuesday again. Tuesday nights, usually. And it, it's always going to be on the, the, w, the, the Foundation website. We have amazing guests. This year we've we got great Matt people. Weiner uh, talking about the Mad Men pilot, Vince Gilligan talking about Breaking Bad. We've got Marta Kaufman and David Crane to talk about talking about friends. friends. And we've got Lita Caligridis who is writing, has written this movie Shutter Island that will just have come out that Scorsese is directing. And even more people than that. Oh yeah, other, um, we haven't said I it think we're. I think Angela told me to stop. At <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.